We're one week away from what you worked so hard for. It's NAIA football with Dan Lee and Don Lee. Don't you let a moment go without thinking about what's there for you to reach out and grasp. Welcome into another edition of NAIA Football with Danley and Donley. I am your host, Jason Danley. Thank you very much for joining us for yet another edition. Edition episode 12, I think we're on. Something like that. But a very special episode as we're not talking any any with any NAI football coaches, any current NAI football coaches, and we're not really previewing things going on to the future. We're going to be talking about the past a little bit, and my co-host and I will sometimes get some grief online that sometimes we talk too much about the NAI history, so I will lead with telling you this. This is an NAI history episode, so if you're not into the history of NAI football and talking about the top 25 NAI football programs of all time, well, this show might not be for you, but it is for me, and it is for my co-host, Mr. Pat Donnelly, who joins me to talk about the top 25 NAI football programs of all time. Pat, thank you again for joining the show. Absolutely. I love that intro, because like you're, you're <laughs> prefacing this whole thing, so there's no one caught off guard. Yeah. We, we are at that age now. It's so funny. I don't feel that old, and I know we're a few months apart in age, but it's so funny because we can actually talk like legitimately about the history of this. Um, mm -hmm. This is not all me. Obviously, everyone's seen the list. I think they're probably watching the show. Um, and you've gone back into the archives and some many, many years ago of the great teams. But we've witnessed most of these great teams. Absolutely. I've either coached against them or watched them at some point or grown up watching them with my dad's teams. And you certainly have covered every NAI team over the years, it seems like. Um, so this is really cool. But, yeah, we're going to go back a little bit. I was a history major at St. Francis Chase. I hope you know that. So oh, I have a great passion for history. I love the History Channel. I love documentaries. I love all that kind of stuff. So uh, we're going to do some cliche radio or podcasting yeah. and and have a list and, and shoot holes and ideas. But, you know, <laughs> and it's supposed to be a thing where, like, we're so used to, like, this back and forth, like the Shan Sharp and, you know, like those those argument shows where, like, I'm taking one side, you're taking another. I really liked your list. So I'm, I'm looking forward to kind of shooting holes in this. I don't disagree with a whole lot. Again, we're pals, so it's good. Well, the, and the thing is about the list, I, I, I think the top 50 would be almost, there's no debate yeah. on the top 50. I mean, sure. it, it's pretty easy to go through 25, you know, okay, yep, those 25, move some teams around, whatever. I think if you just came out with a top 10 list, there there would be some debate on that. But I think it's important to show how some close how close some teams are to that top 10 and in that top 25 and to even talk about some of the teams that aren't on the list and and we might even start off with that there's a couple uh ones that I you know, want to mention just because uh, I don't want people to think I just over overlooked them in the early goings here I just feel like ah, we need a little bit more resume from a couple of these teams before I you know put them on the uh put them on the list here no question I, I think the cool thing too is you have yeah, it's the entire history of the NAI. So you have teams that are no longer a part of the affiliation. Um, so you can almost look at you have the you have the top twenty five of all time. Then you have like the ones that are still a part of the NAI too, uh, that are still still rolling and successful. So yeah, there's there's a lot to talk about. So I'm looking forward to it. So I'll go through my methodology here a little bit, and I I've got my whole article here because I want to make sure like I don't miss anything with this. But it's pretty simple, okay. Total number of NAI championships. I think to be one of the best programs of all time, you have to have won national championships. Total number of postseason appearances, I calculated that in. And then also the ranking on the all-time winningest program. So I think longevity in that case plays a factor with maybe some teams that haven't won an NAI championship, but have been in the NAI a very long time, hence making it a, a program. You're an established program. And then how dominant that program was when they were in the NAI. That's kind of the criteria that I went with. The one thing that I didn't include in this, because I think it's a different list, and, and, and you could talk about this a little bit. There, There is a difference between a great NAI program and a great NAI coach. And the example that I used is, you know, Bethany College in Lindsburg, Kansas. 
Dr. Ted, Ted Kessinger is one of the greatest coaches all time at the NAI level, at the entire coaching level, for what he was able to do at Bethany. But outside of his time at Bethany, Bethany has not been a very good football team. And it, nothing against Dr. Ted, there weren't a lot of postseason wins by Bethany. So that's why a team like that, that had a real historic 20, 25 year run with a single head coach, I respect, and I say, that's a different list. Give me a top 25 coaches of all time, and Ted's in there. You know, Dr. Ted's probably top five on there pretty easily. Uh, but I, I think that's kind of what we have to uh, get into and talk about here and, and, and how some of these teams landed on the list. Certainly, and you have some of those blue, blue blood programs like we talk about all the time that have been around forever and ever and have seemed to have sustained success. Uh, maybe not, you know, seven national championships, but have been around a long time. And they've really never been bad when you kind of think about it. You know, I can think of the, the first couple we're going to discuss are definitely in that category. Have been, you know, there's longevity and there's been sustained success. So a couple teams I want to mention that aren't on the list, but they're right on the verge. And one of them, if I if I redo this next year, they're probably on the list. That being Grandview. Grandview not on the list. A lot of postseason appearances, a lot of wins. They're right on that verge. And if there's a number 26, they're number 26 probably. Um, and, and you could probably argue, ah, you know, they should be 22 or 23, but still a fairly new program. And they haven't had, they have had a national championship. They haven't had multiple national championships because I think there's an argument of like Grandview and Marion coming into the NAI at the same time. Marion's on the list. Grandview's not. How could you do that? I, I, I probably go to the national championship and, and the longevity there, the fact that they've only got one. And then the other one. Uh, just because they're very new, Kaiser. There's going to be people saying you kept the, this year's national champion off the list. They were in the national championship last year. Look what they've done since they started in the NAI. Well, they've been here less than a decade. It's hard to say they're one of the greatest programs in an, an almost 100-year history of NAI football in a less than 10-year period that they've been around. Right. I think your tune would have changed with Grandview if they got past – the first round this year because um, mm -hmm. they were on that cusp. You had him predicted in the final four at minimum, not winning the thing, Jason. And yep. I, I tend to agree with you. And I, first off, first and foremost, played against him a bunch, incredibly coached team, great players. They did a great job of getting talent from Texas to come up to Iowa, just great players. Um, so I think they're around that cusp. I'm right there with you. And I think that's the one I would say uh, that deserves maybe to be on here in that discussion, like you said, 26, but they could be anywhere from 26 to 20, in my opinion, because they're that, they've been that good and that, yeah, um, that solid since they started mid 2000s. Jason, what remind me was right same time Marion did 06, 07. Yeah, like yeah, I want to say Grandview started uh, in 06, or Grandview yeah. started in 05, Marion started in 06. They were like one Something year like apart that. from one another, yeah, right. yep. or, or vice versa. Uh, yep. Somebody can yell at me in the comments and tell me yeah, that it right. was this year and that year. It's fine. Google's out there. <laughs> so let's get rolling. So number 25, I've got Ottawa University uh, in Ottawa, Kansas. Uh, one of the all-time uh, winningest programs in the history of the NAI. Third on the all-time NAI's wins list uh, for winningest programs. Um, Ten postseason appearances. Uh, I think they're an easy in at 25 based on the longevity. I was actually surprised. You know, you start looking at the wins and the number of times they've been to the postseason. And then you think back to, you know, heck, yeah, in the, in the 70s and 80s, they had some appearances. You know, Chris Creighton, who's at Eastern Michigan right now, I believe still, uh, mm -hmm. spent some time at Ottawa, current head coach at Morningside. Steve Ryan was at Ottawa as an assistant. You had Pat Ross go through there, who then went to Lindenwood, who's now at Graceland. And then you had Kent Kessinger there uh, for 10, 15 years. And that program was, you know, they, they were very good, very respectful, always in the KCAC and had some really good teams. Yep. All about longevity here, but have always been pretty successful. You know, the times that we were playing in the playoffs in the 2000s, Ottawa's always in. They're always kind of that, you know, that bottom – that 16 back in those days of taking the 16 teams. Uh, they were a, a one loss or an undefeated team in that conference and got in the playoffs. It seemed like, seemed like every single year. So definitely, uh, you know, third all time wins. You can't, can't disagree with that. Yeah. Hard, hard to argue uh, just overall wins and yeah, longevity wins out for them there. 24. I've got Northwestern Oklahoma state. Here's a program that's got two national championships, two runner up finishes, nine appearances in the NAI postseason, And at, for if you go late 80s, early 90s into the late 90s and early 2000s, 
they were or they were as dominant as 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 can be. I think I said Northwestern. I meant Northeastern Oklahoma State. So go ahead and edit that one right away. Northeastern Oklahoma State uh, coming in at number twenty four. And in, in the eighties, uh, that Oklahoma League uh, was absolutely lights out in the NAI. I mean between them and central Oklahoma and Northwest Oklahoma state, Southwest Oklahoma, like those guys were just on fire uh, in terms of talent and, and where they were at in the NAI. Yeah. They made that jump to division two, but uh, yeah, again, you look at those teams of, of well, those teams from history that you have to go back and, and appreciate their dominance in their era. I got a lot of grief on number 23 for putting St. John's of Minnesota in here. Uh, a lot of people, oh, that's a D three program. They've been D three forever. They were in the NAI. For a good, well, I don't want to say majority, but for a good portion of John Gagliardi's wins. And they were a program that uh, won two titles uh, and just had too short of a time, I think, in the NAI with their success to really put them, you know, as a, as a top 10 or top 15. But the time that they were in, I mean, they won two titles and then made the move ultimately to Division Three. And had the winningest coach of all time. I mean, that's, yeah. you got to put that into context too. Quick trivia. Where did John Gagliardi start his coaching career? Carroll College, Montana. I hey, knew come I on. I know I wouldn't stop you. I wonder if our listeners got that one, though. I should have given some time. I should have said, okay, we'll wait, because I know. Right. Yeah, I knew you do. But it, that, uh, and I want to say, I actually talked to Gilardi about that um, at one of the football coaches' conventions, and I want to say it had something to do with the priest that was running Carroll College or one of the head people at Carroll at that time went to St. John's and, and he kind of followed suit and went with. And Gillardi was a Midwest guy prior to going out to uh, Carroll College and then coming to St. John's. So not incredibly surprising to see him come back, but uh, we could spend an entire episode. Wait, I, I got about one, him. one quick one on him. Were you at the clinic, the coaches, this is the, AFCA coaches clinic that he had the the master coaches of Bobby Bowden. Yep. Was that yes. one, of the, one of the funniest things ever? You can tell the story, but yes, it was it, absolutely it, it, hilarious. I'm going to do, my, gonna do my best Bobby Bowden impression. Mm-hmm. So Coach Cagliardi is known for at, at St. John's. They didn't tackle in practice. I think Correct, they did yeah. a little bit in camp. And when they got into season, I mean, his thing was, I want my guys healthy. You know, I, you know, they had intense practices. You know, they, they had a defense run to the football and things like that. They weren't bringing anybody to the ground. There wasn't contact in practice. There was some blocking and things like that up front, but no really tackling in practice. Mm-hmm. And I, and the greatest thing ever. So let me set the stage a little bit too. I, I kind of got ahead of myself. So you have Bobby Bowden, the late great Bobby Bowden, and the late great John Gagliardi on a stage together, being asked questions by Grant Taft, the 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 AFCA president at the time, just asking yep. the philosophy questions. So you have one of the all time great Division One coaches, then you have the greatest probably Division Three coach and the winningest all time coach of all time. They're together in two opposite ends of the spectrum when it comes to the level of football. <laughs> they were talking about not tackling in practice, and then Gagley already asked Bobby Bell, what do you think about that, Bobby? He goes, well, I think y'all don't play Georgia. That's one of the funniest things I've ever heard. Uh, some of those master coaches uh, interviews that they so do good. at the AFC are just so great when they get guys like that on. I mean, I – we, I, I won't go down that road because it'll divert That's us from our. We'll talk. This program will go an hour and a half. Go to no, number twenty-two. I, I had to get to that one. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, no, it's a it is great story. <laughs> Absolutely great story. Uh, twenty-two Southern Oregon won AI football championship. One runner-up finish. Seven seven appearances in the NAI postseason. Also made an appearance, you know, on the NAI all-time wins list. When you start thinking of like current programs in the NAI on the West Coast. Southern Oregon has been a, a stalwart out there. They, they've always been a tough program. They're, they're a program I know that at six and four uh, one year, they were still probably one of the best teams in the country. I think they may have gave Carroll College their only loss in 04 or 05, and they were six and four. They didn't make the postseason, but their four losses uh, were to like Sacramento State, Humboldt State, uh, Western Washington, like all division or Central Washington. All Division II programs. So uh, Southern Oregon is just one of those solid programs in the NAI. Yeah, you watched when they won the national championship. Was it 2014? Mm. I think it was, yeah, yeah, 14, 15. No, 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 it was later. Uh, it might have been 14 now that you say 14, that. Yeah. Marion won 15. We won 16, 17. Yeah. I, I saw them to film a bunch. And they, holy smokes, were they good. Offensively, you know, air raid stuff, you know, throwing around the yard. They were as good as we've seen throwing the football. 
uh, on film. You were looking at me. We could play these guys in the playoffs, that sort of thing. When they were in their heyday, you know, seven, eight years ago, they were as good as I've seen offensively. So, yeah, uh, I'm right Austin, Austin Dodge at quarterback. You yeah. know, there, there's Absolutely. a lot of – and, again, we could do another list, top 25 NAI quarterbacks of all time. He's a guy that I don't think gets as much love – uh, as what he should at the NAI level, but I mean, he's the all-time leading passer, scorer. I mean, he he broke basically every passing record that was out there in the NAI, and and you know, four-year player, four-year starter for him. I mean, that always helps bring your program along too. Yeah, he can throw it, no doubt. Twenty-one, we go to Saint Xavier, uh, one NAI football championship, sixteen appearances in the NAI postseason. Uh, they've only been around NAI football really the last quarter century, but. You know, outside of maybe the, those first couple startup years, I mean, th- this is a program six and four, seven and three, eight and two, nine and two, ten and one. I mean, Feminist has always got a solid team, and even in the years that they're down, I mean, you look at their losses, and it's not like this is they're not a program getting their doors blown off forty nine to ten. You know, they're they're always competitive, they're always tough. Since Coach Feminist got there in nineteen ninety nine, they've never been bad, Jason. Ever? No. I mean, they're always competitive, and if not. A top six, seven program in the NEI, many years competing for the national championship. So uh, they won in 2011, I believe, off the top of my head. And that was one of the better teams that I've ever coached against. Um, Chicagoland, obviously, NEI school, they were attractive to transfers coming back into that area and still are. Talk about getting some guys, man. They can get them there. Uh, And Coach Femme and that staff does such a tremendous job. And Great group of guys, too. Those coaches are just fantastic, good guys, and do a tremendous job there. Great program. Yeah, that, yeah I, I've always enjoyed my time around St. Xavier. Just a welcoming staff, like good guys. And then, then when it's time to compete, like, get away from us. But, like, I Absolutely. would show up there, and it's like, where are you going to go eat? Well, I was thinking about going here. Don't go there. This is where you should – I mean, just – I, I could probably do a tour of Chicago with the staff at St. Xavier, just eating food. All you'll get invited. I want to do that. I'm two and a half hours from there, buddy. I'm in. So it, when, when I when I get it planned out, you'll be there as oh, well, buddy. That'd be a blast. Number twenty, Dickinson State University, twenty four postseason appearances. They're they're steady. Uh, they've never made it to a, not, a, a national title game. Uh, they're one of those programs. Kind of reminds me of uh, Benedictine with Larry Wilcox. You know, they had Hank Bijou there forever, Pete Stanton now. This is a program that's been solid for years. You just you want to will them to a championship game because that's the like the feather in the cap for their program. But again, a tough place to coach at too, and a tough place to be good. You're in Western North Dakota. Your recruiting base in Western North Dakota and Eastern Montana. It, you're not dealing with getting kids out of Chicago land and driving 20 minutes to all these different high schools and being able to get a, a full roster. I mean, you're, you're bringing in transfers, you're going for hours and you, and you got to develop your local kids. Eight man football, a lot of that too. Um, I'm sure in their recruiting base. So you're right. It, the, what a great regular season program. They're always there. They're always winning the, whatever league they're in, they're going to win and get in the postseason. So, but then fortunately yeah, they draw schools like University of Sioux Falls or Carroll College in the first round and, Seem to be every single year uh, for many years, so they do a great job. Yeah, Dickinson just a uh, program I I like a lot. You know, I'm a I'm a country kid at heart. They're they're a, a school out on a town out in Western North Dakota, ag program that entire thing. So I I get down with that. Number nineteen, Northwestern Oklahoma State, one NAI football championship, two runner up finishes, twelve appearances in the NAI postseason, late nineties, early two thousands. You didn't want to draw this team. Because they were going to have some dudes on that team that were going to hurt you and would be more athletic than anybody on your squad. I remember them playing Georgetown in 1999 when they won the national title in Northwest Oklahoma. Georgetown jumped out to a lead in the run and shoot off and scored a bunch of points. Those guys took the ball in the second half and ground and pound Georgetown to what they did where they wanted to in that second half. Of the yeah. game. It was a very, I mean, I was coming right into college. I remember watching that game because I was obviously following the Georgetown program because dad coached there. Mm-hmm. Um, and they, you could see their dominance, the personnel they had. If I remember, they were a triple option team. They had like a 240 pound transfer quarterback that no one could tackle. I mean, it's like <laughs> a physical team. I remember their coach was kind of an old school triple option guy, and it was really cool to watch. And yeah, in their heyday, when they were going, man, they were outstanding. And I believe they, the quarterback's uh, name was Al Hunt. I'm only going you off would remember here. that. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Al Hunt was a player. I remember him. Yeah. And right after Georgetown won two national titles in a row. I mean, so they were yeah. they were right on that cusp, and Georgetown was there and had a lead in that game, and Northwest just came out and beat them up. It was uh, – yeah, they were a physical football team. Like you said, people did not want to play them in the late 90s, that's for sure. Well, 
And then you even go into the 2000s, one of the right. runner-up teams. I mean, the, the defense oh, that yeah. they had, the Black Cloud defense, and then you had a quarterback that, well, a wide receiver actually playing quarterback who was one of the best athletes ever in the NAI, and Patrick Creighton, who went on to the Cowboys and played sure. some in the NFL. I mean, that was a guy where, all right, we need to get a big play, bring in the other quarterback, let's put Patrick wide out, and we're just going to sling it to him out there, and he's going to catch it for 70 yards and score a touchdown, or he's going to return a kickoff for a touchdown. I mean, uh, the guy was an absolutely amazing athlete. What year were they in the finals in the 2000s? Who beat him? Uh, Carroll, I think. Was it one of the Carroll teams? Oh, you know I what? Think... Was it? Was it a? Because Carroll beat Georgetown. Was it three? No four. They it... beat us. I'm trying to think where North was. I they were always in the playoffs because they had a resurgence after they won it in '99. I think the coaching staff left and took mm-hmm. a couple years to kind of build back up. We have to go back in the archives and look at the details. Yeah. So were... Tim Tim Albin was the head coach there, and then Tim Albin uh, actually spent time as a GA at Nebraska after the national championship. Then he went to the Ohio staff, and that's where he is now. Right. If I remember, they even had Nebraska and on their helmet back in those days. So they were kind of – is that that, you know, that same yeah. offense, you know, that option offense and, and two backs in the backfield and, you know, pounds you in oblivion. So they, yep. were, uh, they were they were the real deal, no doubt. And, and then Garen Higgins was the head coach, and then Garen Higgins went to Emporia State, where he is now good D2 program. So Absolutely. I, I, I need to just shut the brain down occasionally. You are an encyclopedia, my friends. Unbelievable. I yeah, it's it's painful even for me at times. Like <laughs> it's just I can't remember it's basic insane. things about my everyday life, but that is I just know. right there. Yeah. Uh Benedictine comes in at number 18. Mentioned him earlier. One NAI runner-up finish, 15 appearances in the NAI postseason. Uh, they don't have a full 100-year program history. Really, they they came on in the 70s when Larry Wilcox uh, came back on as as head coach. Uh, but they've been consistent in the NAI for a very long time. They've always been right there. And uh, if you if you look at programs you want to model, you know if you're going to start a program, a handful of programs in the NAI you want to model them after. Uh, Benedictine is definitely one of them. Yeah, first class program. They do it right. You know, Coach Wilcox is. You know, if you think about a traditional, like, figurehead, great football coach, motivator, first-class person that runs a great program, first-class program, Coach Wilcox those guys you think about. Even has the local, like, sports bar in town. I mean, how cool is that? I mean, yep. um, I just that program's so cool to me. We got to play him, you know, once. Never got to go there, which is unfortunate. But, I, you know, I saw the video. What a cool setup at the stadium. Just a really cool place. And I think, yeah. you know, they just did such a great job. And like I said, it was a first-class program. And they were so well coached, you know, uh, not to root against uh, my friends at Morningside. But, you know, you want Coach Wilcox to win that national championship. It was so close a few years ago. And, of course, Morningside had won three of them. But uh, he was so close. And it was, it was kind of sad that he, you know, he called it quits after that because he got so close. But, uh, yeah, yeah, first class group. And and uh, a program that adored their head coach. I, I was at oh, yeah. one of their spring games one year. And the alumni surprised him uh, with a new car. Nothing fancy. Like this wasn't a Jag or anything like that. Yeah. I think it was a, uh, I think it was a Chevy or Cavalier or so. No, it was it was like a get back because oh, really? he'd been driving the same car forever. And the alumni bought him a car. I mean, it was, it, just a a great program. One of those I'd love to see a documentary on uh, the Larry Wilcox era. Uh, cool seven seventeen. We go to Marion University. Two NAI football championships. Uh, two runner-up finishes, 12 appearances in the NAI postseason. One of the coaches that uh, helped get them there was on our program just a couple days ago. Uh, you can't deny what they've done in a short period of time to become one of the top programs in, in the history of NAI football. No doubt. I mean, they have made as big a splash maybe as anyone since their existence. I mean, won the national championship in six years um, of being a part of the NAI. They're in a great hotbed of recruiting, um, you know, this level of football players and do a great job in, here in the state of Indiana of getting great players. I mean, at one time, Jason, these guys had three Indiana Mr. Footballs on the one roster. That's oh, wow. a big deal. I mean, and again, Indiana is not Ohio or Pennsylvania or Texas or Georgia it's football. Still the best football still, player in the state. Yeah. And they had three of them at one time. Uh, and they were a transfer place, you know, again, kids that go play Division One or FCS uh, Division two, somewhere else, come back home, they go to Marion. So um, I think, you know, Coach Karras is kind of doing more of, you know, getting kids from, you know, the high school programs and developing. But it's been a place that they've gotten players. I mean, they've got guys that played in the NFL for multiple years. 
Uh, they had a tight end a couple years ago, a guy named Rashawn Hogan, played wide receiver for a couple different organizations mm-hmm. in the NFL and was one of the most dominant players I've ever seen at this level. So, um, yeah, <laughs> they are formidable, to say the least, from the very beginning you can see it. Yeah, very solid program. And you start comparing them, like if you go back in the 50-year history of the NAI, there, there's a couple other programs that have got one or two championships that I, I took some grief for not putting on here. But I'm like, so in the other thing I look at, too, is in a 50-year time period or probably, a let's say, a 30-year time period in the NAI, some of those older programs took all 30 years and won one or two. Here's a program less than a quarter century has got two and two runner-up finishes. That's pretty dang good. I mean, they're, honestly, they're getting back there. You could probably have three or four more. I mean, they yeah. could have been right there. I mean, they had some injury bug, you know, hit them a couple of times in the postseason where I thought maybe one of their best teams, they stubbed their toe early in the playoffs. You're like, what happened there? Well, you know, every team has a bad game at some point. They had theirs mm-hmm. in the playoff one year. One of the better teams I've ever seen is 2016, Marion team, as good as I've ever seen. And they lost in the first round to a really, really good, I think it was uh, Eastern Oregon team, flew across country and beat them as a second round, actually, I think. Yep. Um, <laughs> Jason, I'm telling you, it was a good team as I've ever seen. I mean, they were exceptional. Well, and um, I think the thing you got to look at with them is that, I mean, th- this little feather in, in your cap and the in, in the cap of the coaches in, in your league, but, you know, they're playing in the Mid-States Football Association. They're they're playing against feminists. They're playing against Coach Donnelly. They're playing against Indiana Wesley, and now they're playing against some really good football. So to survive a regular season and be good doesn't mean that the postseasons, because you, you're going to come into that beat up. You know, you're going to come into there and, and, and you know, hopefully not have a let up, but ultimately if you do, uh, what happens in 2016 happens in the postseason, unfortunately. Yeah. Those, those seasons, they beat a really good Division II program in the same city, University of Indianapolis, and beat them badly. Um, that was their non-conference two years in a row and won both of those <laughs> games. Those teams were playoff teams in Division II. And I'm telling you, Marion beat them by three touchdowns in 2016. Yeah. So it was, yeah, that tells you the, the type of talent and the – you know, the program that that is. And they're going to be on the rise once again. They're already there in the play- postseason. But I can see them taking a huge step this year with Coach Karras now getting, you know, his recruits in once again and, and establishing, um, you know, that program, how he started it. So it's going to be exciting to see. Uh, 16, Missouri Valley College. One runner-up finish, 13 postseason appearances in the NAI. Number two on the all-time uh, wins list for NAI football. They've been around forever. NAI Hall of Fame coach Volney Ashford. Uh, was their coach in the 50s and 60s. Paul Troth had been there up until this last year, and he always had that program as a solid, solid program uh, participating in at, at the NAI level. These run of schools here, Jason, coming up with the Blue Bloods, to me, the, the traditional teams have been ar- were around a long time. You know, Some have left the affiliation. But th- this one and the next one are the teams that have been around forever and won a ton of games. And, again, the longevity and the sustained success is uh, is definitely – Definitely present with these these two for sure. Yes, Missouri Pittsburgh. Valley. Yeah, Pittsburgh State comes in at number fourteen. Who you're referring to? Two NAI championships. Oh, Baker one, first, one, Jay. You got fifteen, right? Oh, I, I jumped yep. right over them. Can't forget people the at, old Wildcats. They, people at Baker are going to be yelling at me now. You know how dare you dishonor the memory of Charlie Richard and the great things he did for this program? I'm sorry, my apologies. But yes, fifth, four, fifteen. I can't count, Pat. Sorry, 15, Baker, two NAI runner-up finishes, 20 postseason appearances, uh, number one all-time in wins at the NAI level. Uh, definitely one of those programs that, sure, you'd like to see some more championships, but they just win every year. And and if you go back to the days of district competition uh, at the NAI level, they'd be in a district where, yeah, they, they may have won their conference or, or uh, won through, but then what's your, what's your reward? You get to go to Oklahoma and play. And one of those great Oklahoma teams, uh, there was just so, so many years. There were so many good programs at the NAI uh, when Charlie Richard was uh, having his run. Uh, that uh, They just didn't cash in on many national titles. Well, a lot of football games, you can't deny them, and they've had recent success. We played in the 2016 National Championship, had a National Player of the Year, Logan Burchell. It's a heck of a ball player, great football team, and they were good for a handful of years after that. I know they're uh, – Back in it this year, postseason, right? Louisiana Christian, I think yep. it was the first round game. Yeah, um, mm-hmm. they're they're back and uh, you know tremendous program again. That sustained success we talk about. That's it's such a challenge to do at this level uh, at any level. Uh, yeah. They certainly certainly have been successful. Football matters at Baker. You know no that's it's it's a it's a program where, like you said, there are blue blood football matters there. Fourteen 
now that I can read. 14, Pittsburgh State, two NAI championships, one runner-up finish, seven appearances in the NAI postseason. Uh, they found their way onto the ESPN, like top 250 programs of all time list. Uh, that A lot of that, those championships and success that they referred to was at the NAI level. I mean, they, they were a tremendous NAI program uh, before moving on to Division II. Mm-hmm. Yeah, won a bunch. I remember when I was a little kid, you remember the, the legend of Pittsburgh State, that's for sure. The Gorillas. How do you forget about the Gorillas? Yeah. uh, Central Arkansas comes in at number 13, three NAI football championships, 13 appearances in the postseason, 70s, 80s, 90s, before they went Division II. I mean, they were... They were a powerhouse, and and they've they've continued to move up and continued to be a power in small college football. They FCS now, I think. They are. Yep, they are FCS now. Yeah. It's one of those schools, of state schools, back when NAI had a lot of state schools. Yeah. I think they're state school. I assume they are. Central yeah, Arkansas, yeah. Right? Central yeah. Arkansas is state yeah. school. Yeah. Home of Scotty Pippen, of course. You know, basketball guy. <laughs> you are correct. Yeah. Useless. Twelve. Will get, Twelve. We go to uh, Linfield in Oregon. Three NAI football championships. Three runner-up finishes. Fifteen appearances in the NAI postseason. Uh, they went D three in the nineties, but their run in the NAI prior to that was, was historic. And I think a lot of people now because of their recent success at the NAI or at the division three level, they just always think that's a D three program. Uh, Linfield was a quality, quality, uh, division or quality, quality NAI program before going division three. I think Hawkins used to be the coach at Boise and Colorado was there at the time. I think late nineties. Is that right? Dan Hawkins. I'm pretty sure he was at um, Linfield, or is he at another school in Oregon? He was at Willamette. And Willamette, sorry, sorry, sorry. Man, he was at Willamette. Thanks for correcting me, of course, Encyclopedia BMI. I, <laughs> I knew somebody was <laughs> from in Oregon from there. Um, yeah, but they were great. I mean, they were always in there. They were always, always in the mix. I remember, again, you know, the 90s and late 90s. Did they play? I'm trying to think. That was Willamette against Finley. What was their last appearance in the, in the national championship? When, when Ooh, you, you're going to have me stumped. 96? 90, 94? Okay. Ninety-five, yeah. something right around one of those years. Right. I believe the head coach was Rushman, okay. Adley Rushman, because his uh, grandson is the catcher for the Baltimore Orioles. Oh boy, man! Holy smokes! <laughs> yeah, it's getting deep, buddy. Sorry, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, Eleven, another uh, school that's moved on to Division Three, Pacific Lutheran. Frosty West Ring, three NAI football championships, four runner-up finishes, 15 appearances in the NAI postseason, got a notch ahead of Linfield for having, you know, just that extra appearance in an NAI championship game. Did you ever meet Coach West Ring? Yes. Yes, I did. What, what a great guy. So my dad's team at Georgetown, the very first national championship in Georgetown College history, 1991, against Pacific Lutheran and Frosty West Ring. So that was my first memories as an 11-year-old kid. Um, meeting him and being a part of that game and well, just a classic game against those two programs uh, on a muddy field in December in Georgetown, Kentucky. Back in those days, there was no neutral site. Yep. Georgetown hosted Pacific Luther in 1991 in central Kentucky and right before Christmas. So it was kind of a cool deal. One of my great memories growing up of, of being a part of that game as a ball boy at 11 years old. So pretty cool. Yeah. I, uh, I interviewed Frosty uh, twice, I want to say, uh, back in the, the older VSN days. He had a, uh, his interviewed him about his old book because I think he was going into the NAI Hall of Fame. And then he had a new book come out. And I interviewed him about that. And then I met him uh, at uh, Coach's Convention. I want to say it might have been when he went into the NAI Hall of Fame or he was at the Hall of Fame banquet. One of the two. But, yeah, I got a chance to talk to Frosty and just is he, all is he in college game. football, college football hall of fame? He should be if he's not. I think he is. I believe so, yeah. yeah I, I yeah. think he's in the college football hall of fame. He passed away. He he lived to be a ripe old age, I'm pretty sure. I want to say yes. pushing 90 or so, or at least in his absolutely. 90. Yeah. Yep. I mean, he used to come to the ACA, I mean, up until towards the end of his life, and he was still there. So yeah. Um, yeah, what a prolific writer. He said multiple books. I remember he had one in the early nineties when dad was was coaching against him. Um, you know, when he was at Georgetown. So that, that was book one that had a second one. Um, yep. Once again, it was one of those programs you could tell there was a culture there with Pac Lutheran. I mean, they had, they were called the Lutes, short for Lutherans. Yeah. Uh, that was, that was their deal. Uh, but it was a cool deal. Like it was just a, you can see it was like a true culture. And, and it was like they had like all kinds of sayings and slogans and they had shirts and stuff. It was kind of cool um, to see how, you know, Coach Westering did things. So, but yeah, what a, what a first class guy for sure. Make, make the big time where you are. 
That's uh, that's right. That's, 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 yeah, that was a line. That, had that those every man a loot. Like he had, a, he had all kinds of stuff. I remember. So, uh, you know, pretty cool. Uh, number 10, we get into Sioux Falls at number 10, four NAI championships, three runner up finishes, 16 appearances in the NAI postseason. They spent four decades uh, in the making it to the NAI postseason before they decided to go Division II. Bob Young, obviously, the catalyst behind that program success for many years before Kalen DeBoer took it over. And then the uh, squad uh, then went to Jed Stugert for a year, who got into a national championship game before moving on to Division II. Well, this is the one, if I had to disagree with you, we're going to have our whole uh, discussion and have like the contrarian point of yeah. view. I think this is the top six, five program. Um, yeah. They haven't been gone that long. I think you punished them as they left because we loved them. Man, were they the best. Um, again, no mystery that the head coach of Alabama right now was was the man behind this program. Obviously, Coach Young, who, who Kalen played for, Kalen DeBoer played for, that when he took things over, holy smokes. I yeah. mean, Jason, I've been fortunate enough to, to play so many of these great programs. They might have been as good as anyone. 2008, so you have obviously Coach DeBoer. They had a couple of national players of the year that they won in consecutive years. Yep. Um, and you have um, you have this defense. I've never seen like it before. I mean, transfers, and we had guys like a left tackle that played the Pac-12. You have – um, a linebacker at 6'4", 240 pounds. I mean, they got players to come to Sioux Falls, South Dakota, um, and get it going. Chuck Morrell, the defensive coordinator, just the defensive coordinator at Washington last year, was their D.C., and I tell you what, our heads were spinning of all the stuff that they were throwing at us. I mean, just brilliant, brilliant stuff. The, the coaching, the players, the whole culture, they had a role in there. So, again, if that anybody from Alabama is listening to this, who's an Alabama <laughs> tied fan, I can tell you, Obviously, look what Kalen DeBoer has done and Chuck Morello have done everywhere they've ever been. The future's bright in Tuscaloosa. It may not be this next year, but I'm telling you in time, these guys know how to win, and they yeah. are so good. And it started years and years ago at this level in the NAI with Sioux Falls. They're, Jason, what a, what a place. What a tough place to play. What a tough team to play because of their preparation and culture. So the, the reason I have them at 10 and not higher – goes to the early years of Bob Young and the pre-Bob Young era at the NAI level. And and I, I mean this with love. But at that time, the Sioux Falls program was as bad as my Dana College program. Like, Dana, we were cellar dwellers in the NIAC and the GPAC. We had a couple good years. We weren't great. And Sioux Falls, for many years was one of the only teams that Dana College could put on a schedule and potentially win that game. So from personal experience, I'm like, all right, that program was pretty bad for a couple of years. And if uh, what if years was this? this is back before I was could remember. Oh yeah, this was this was in the 70s and in the 70s, 80s. 80s uh, but, okay. um, Dana's all time win. So I w- when the G Pack started. Dana was actually, I want to say, ten and eight or nine and eight lifetime against Sioux Falls. They had they had beaten them more times than they lost to them. Now wow. they never came close to beating them again over the next ten years. But but there there were some years where they uh, they were not good. So again, I go to look at the whole program. That that's why I put them at ten. It, if you said Jason, they're number five, I'd go. All right, you're probably right, but so good. I got them at ten. Plus, I also know Sioux Falls fans get all riled up about things. They do. And they'll, oh, they more do. clicks, baby. More clicks, more yeah. traffic, baby. Let's go. Yeah. Let's get them mad. Uh, number nine. I probably skip over this one. <laughs> St. Francis, Indiana. Two NAI football championships, three runner-up finishes, 19 appearances in the NAI postseason. Uh, they had only missed the postseason twice since starting 90. I think that's three times now. It's three now, yeah. Three last out. year again, yeah, they were right on that cusp last year, close. Um, yeah, sustained success. I mean, I'll tell you, I was obviously involved in close to the situation with Dad starting the program. Been there ever since. Um, it's hard to do. It's hard to be successful year in and year out. And again, you get to year six of the program. Well, first off, year two of the program won the conference championship, the Mid States Football mm-hmm. Association, in the second year of the program. Which back in those days, so Finley leaves. We St. Francis jumps in. You're still playing teams like Walsh and Malone, and and some really Tiffin was still on the in the the organization mm-hmm. at that 
point. Uh, some really, really good football teams you had to play year in, year out, not to mention Chicagoland schools. Um, so won the league in the second year of football. And I, I think that when that happened in 99, that program took off. I, I was fortunate to be obviously very close to it, saw it, and there was a, a culture, there was a confidence to that program from that success in year two that just skyrocketed. In the national championship in year six of the program in 2004, 2005 and 2006 lost all three times by a combined total of like nine points. Something yeah. crazy. Last second field goals. You were there in 04 heartbreaker against the great Carroll college team and Tyler uh, Emmert. <laughs> and Caleb board, uh, Caleb board to beat it, beat us in 06. So we, two times against Carroll college in 04, 05. Caleb DeBoer's great team. You know, that was kind of start of really Sioux Falls yeah. on the rise once again. And they beat us in a really good game, lost by three in that game. Um, so again, they were always there. Uh, and competing at the national level. I think at one point, Jason, the final, final fours, it was like eight straight, something crazy. Yeah. So mm-hmm. again, sustained success. Then finally broke through 10 years after making the national championship three years in a row of winning back to back in 16 and 17. Had some great teams. And, you know, I was, uh, you know, the offense coordinator for those teams. And it was, uh, you know, it was a special time. And, Great. Got the all-time winningest coach, too. That old guy is still in charge, the old white-haired devil. He's still going at almost 73 years old. So, you know, Pops is still going. He's won over 350 games in his career and uh, still going strong. So, um, yeah, sustained success, USF, for sure. Yeah. I mean, it's absolutely, uh, again, programs, schools out there, there's a lot of NAI schools that are saying, hey, we're going to add football. Uh, there's like two or three that I point to and I say, you're going to start football? Okay. You go to St. Francis and you ask him all sorts of questions. You, you sit down with Kevin Donnelly, you buy him a nice dinner, and you just sit there with a notepad and you say, what'd you do? And you go through that with him. And then you go to Grandview and you do the same thing there. You go to Marion, you do the same thing there. These are teams that when they started their football program, it wasn't like some of the programs that you see where it's like, well, you know, we're going to recruit some kids and, you know, winning. Yeah, we're like everyone. We want to win. But like, it's not a culture of winning. Those programs, when they started it, it's like, no, we're going to be good. We're going to be good right now. We're not going to do this whole like, oh, JV year and oh, we're only sophomores now. No, but after we're going to be mad that we didn't yet win year one. And by year two, if we're not competing for the conference championship, then we're, we're going to push even harder after that. There was a plan. Like all those schools you mentioned, there was a distinct plan. Some of these other schools, you kind of think, Ugh, still playing at a high school. Well, Kaiser, Kaiser, be- another great example. No question. I mean, to have success like that. This was year six, I believe, as well. I think it tied the Marion record of sixth year of the program winning a national title. Again, St. Francis was there in the sixth year and lost in a last-second field goal to Carroll College. So, um, yeah, a program that's been around since the late 90s and have been in it, it seems like like every single year. So, again, testament to, uh, to my dad. Done a heck of a job and still going. Number eight, we go to Morningside. Three NAI football championships, one runner-up finish. 20 appearances in the NAI postseason since coming back to the NAI from Division II Morningside. Consistently a top 10 team. Uh, They made the postseason every single season since 2014, which was they spent one year in the NAI, not in the postseason, and then they've been in the postseason every year since. Yeah, since 2004. Just incredible. We played them their first time back in uh, the postseason. That was our first round game that year. And you can just see the build ever since that point. And they had great battles with Sioux Falls in the GPAC League. It was them and Sioux Falls down. I think it was like the last game of the year, wasn't it, Jason? Mm-hmm. Throughout yep. those you know mid to late 2000s when Sioux Falls was winning national championships. Again, Morningside was really their, their best competition, and there was always great games there. Um, and you could see you know Coach Ryan building something really special there. Um, and I will tell you, much like I said with the Marion teams before, having you know, a, a firsthand experience with Morningside, some of their best teams did not win national championships. And Coach yeah. will tell you that. We had so many battles with them in our championships and in, in, in 15 or excuse me, 16 and 17. Talk about great, great football teams, well coached teams, teams that executed at a high level. We were just better that day against them. And I, I think if we're driving to Sioux Falls, um, Iowa, and it was reversed that the travel was different, they win that game probably against us and we don't have national championships. So it's kind of that way. And then we went out there in 18 and they beat us in overtime. Uh, in, in their location, in snow and you know, a good uh, Midwestern blizzard. Uh, <laughs> but just like you said, sustains the second. We, it, it's we've talked about it all the time, you know, through this list, and, and they've done it. And I think you know, the last handful of years of winning three national championships, but being right in the mix for for how long? For twenty years. So yeah, um, 
yeah, just tremendous job there. They, they've got a role in there for sure. And and there's a number of times that uh, they were so good in the Great Plains Athletic Conference, but they were competing against those really good Sioux Falls teams in the late 2000s. You, you, if you would have pulled Sioux Falls out three years earlier, Morningside might have won a national championship one of those years. I mean, it, no it, they were they were that good. But then yeah. when in the, you're in the semifinals playing a conference game against a team that you've already played, or the one year that they did actually beat Sioux Falls in the regular season, then they get into postseason and, and, and Sioux Falls just starts doing this. So, yeah. Right. yeah. Number seven, Northwestern out of Iowa, another Great Plains Athletic Conference team, three NAI football championships, five runner-up finishes, 25 appearances in the NAI postseason. And over the history of the NAI, Red Raiders have been one of the most reliable programs. They, they've made it to postseason uh, in, in six different decades. I mean, to me, they're they're like, they're the hamburger of the NAI. What are we having for dinner? You know what, let's have hamburgers. They're, it's just good, it's tasty. You can rely on it. You can't really screw it up. That's Northwestern. They're they're that that sort of reliable. Do, are are they sexy? Are they this sexy program and all these championships and innovated success with their offense? No, they're just they're they they play good Midwestern football basically. Mm-hmm. They've had uh, great teams here recently too. You know, national player of the year this flat this past year and very well coached. Um, again, have a great system of getting great players there and developing them. And they've certainly done that, especially the last handful of years. We go to number six, Findlay out of Ohio. They've been mentioned on this before. One of the reasons we talk about them and their success in the NAI is because they won four NAI football championships, 13 appearances in the postseason. The Oilers are just a program whose postseason in the NAI has was historic, lots of championships. And again, I look at and I, I meant to talk to Coach Karras about this when we had him on, but that league that Finley is in now with Walsh, and let's just call it the graduates of the NAI League. I, I just I, I want to take that conference and say, guys, just come back. Look cool. at your history. Look at the success that you had at this level and, and, and come back to the NAI where you belong. Because I, I think the University of Finley, oh, man, what a great addition to the NAI right now. When was the last time we talked about him in – having any sort of sustained success at division two yeah, historic they're, they're NAI okay. program. Yeah. They're, they're okay. fine. They're okay. Um, obviously a hotbed of, of great high school football in Ohio. Like you said, those are all private schools. I will tell you and people that know small college football, division two, NAI division three, public schools dominate division two. Yep. Private schools at the NAI level, 90% of us are, are private schools, 95% probably. And again, you have Finley and Tiffin and, and Walsh. Those are private schools that, they belong in the NAI, like you said. Um, and Finley was an absolute power, 70s, 80s, 90s, dominant teams, had tremendous players, national players of the year, transfer players from all over the country. Um, as a little kid, got to see him play. And you're just like, you're stunned to see the speed, the athleticism, the size of those programs uh, back in those days. You know, Coach Stram was um, – was um, you know just unbelievable. Strom actually, is the pronunciation was Strom was was a legend, um, and yeah, Dad had battles with them at Georgetown, and then when they left Division Two, they left the Mid States Football Association. That's where St. Francis slid into that slot uh, with their departure. So I'm with you, Jay. That's that's a program that is, uh, you know, it's about an hour from Fort Wayne. It's not far, hour and fifteen minutes or so. So yeah, it fit really nicely back in the Mid States Football Association. 100%, 100%. Number five, we go to Georgetown College, three NAI football championships, two runner-up finishes, 23 appearances in the postseason. First trip to the NAI postseason was in 1987. Five appearances in the title game over their history, consistent winning. I mean, again, you've talked about it. Uh, your dad was one of the people that helped to build that Georgetown College program, then to Bill Cronin. Uh, and now we've got Chris Oliver there now. I mean, there hasn't been a lot of coaches in the last 40 years of Georgetown College football, which is one of the reasons why they've had that sustained success. Dad got there in 1982. I think Dad was the fourth coach in five years uh, at that time. And they were in like that transition period from – they were dual dual membership, NAI Division II back in those days. Yep. Um, played a really unique schedule, playing you know some what well, you now are FCS schools and things like that. It was kind of a unique deal. Then got in the NEI the late 80s, and Dad you know, got in the playoffs in 87, lost to a good Westminster team in 87, and started building from there. Then won the national title in 1991 um, at Georgetown and you know didn't have facilities, and it was just kind of a – it was a tough situation, and Dad made it 
great. And it was such a great culture. What a great place to grow up in that area as a little kid and mm-hmm. seeing that success in that program. So, so coach Crone was dad's offensive coordinator back in those days mm-hmm. um, and coached the offensive line. And, you know, was there you know, that whole period of the eighties and the early nineties Then dad, dad left and, and coach Crone actually coached high school for a while. Then came back to, to Georgetown, I think 1995, 1996, yep. five, um, and got that thing back on track, wins two more national championships, um, and puts, you know, Georgetown College, you know, in the top five of, the, of this list. You know, Dad and Bill Cronin, those two guys, and Coach Cronin was there. Goodness, Jay, was it 23, 24 years probably? Yeah. Uh, it was a long time, and, you know, I don't know how many, exactly how many wins, but uh, they were an absolute force. Those teams in the late 90s, early 2000s, once again, some of the best I have ever seen in, in you know, firsthand. Uh, they just had mm-hmm. such a great thing going there in that period, and, um, you know, Unbelievable! They, they're deserving of that top five spot for sure. Yeah, and it's one of those programs that too in the in the last twenty year history of the NAI. Whenever there's a rumor of somebody going to Division Two, people keep keep talking about Georgetown, but they've stayed in the NAI. They've had the success, and I and I, I honestly feel like they look at other some of the programs on this list and they go, "Now wait a second, do we want to continue to be in the postseason and be relevant at this level, or do we want to make the jump, get a different logo on the wall, and never see the postseason again?" Because there's some some of the teams on this list, and that's kind of been their fate, unfortunately. Private liberal arts schools typically don't do well in Division Two, and I'm with you. And back in the days I was getting to Jay was there was no facilities back when Dad was there. Unbelievable yeah. facilities now. Um, you know, Coach Cronin you know, started building those things with the, the administration there, and what a great place. And Coach Oliver now is reaping the war rewards of that, and he's now you know putting his uh, fingerprint on things as well. And 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 that program is as strong as ever. Moving on to number four, Carson Newman out of Tennessee. They got themselves five NAI football championships, 11 appearances in the postseason from the 70s to the early 90s. Carson Newman, just if, if this show existed, we would be talking about Carson Newman like we talk about the historic programs like, like Carroll College and Sioux Falls and the Georgetowns. So like they were, they were the NAIA brand back at that time. No doubt. And I think they've had great success in Division Two as a private school. Pittsburgh State's a public school, so they've had yep. you know, they've competed. I think they might even won a national title in Division Two. But yep. I think Carson Newman has done the best as a private school, a typical NAI type school, have done the best at the Division Two level. But they're still like an NAI high school. I mean, they're a Southern Baptist private liberal arts in East Tennessee. I mean, just you know, <laughs> screams NAI to me. Uh, but they've been successful in Division Two. You know, Ken Sparks. The late great, um, it's one of the top, I think, top six or seven all time. Yeah, uh, Wayne is coaches of all time, first class person, and uh, you know that that program, like you said, powerhouse. When you think of eighties, nineties, holy smokes! I mean, I, and they were like an option team. And you see the stats and the rushing records. I mean, it was just something that was just astronomical in that time. So, um, yeah, dominant program for sure. Go to number three, Westminster out of Pennsylvania, six NAI football championships, three runner up finishes. 17 appearances in the NAI postseason, a 31 and 11 all time record in the NAI postseason, and a tie for the second most wins won uh, in the uh, NAI. So, I mean, they they were they they were one of those programs you hate to see leave. Uh, they were one of the stalwarts of, of uh, NAI football for decades. Like you said, now they've been a relevant Division three. I mean, yeah. when they're NAI, Jason. I mean, I have seen these teams. I'm old enough to and Dad played against them multiple times. Guy named Joe Fusco was the head football yep. coach there. And they look like a Western Pennsylvania. This is north side of Pittsburgh. They are blue collar, tough, physical, always had a 1600 or 1800 yard back, um, high formation, downhill. They're going to beat you up physically, play strong defense. They look like Penn State. They're navy and white. I mean, it was a whole thing. The Italian football coach in the side looked like Joe Paterno, same glasses, yep. same pants, same get up. It was crazy. It's like, we're at Georgetown College. Is this Clemson versus you know Penn State? This is a weird deal. Just the way the team <laughs> looked. And it was just a physical, cold game in Western Pennsylvania in the playoffs every time you went up there. And they were impressive, man. I mean, they get six national championships. And, um, yeah, they were dominant back. And, and I got to see them in the 80s and 90s a few times as a little kid. Yeah, again, great program. Love to see them back in the NAI. That doesn't happen very often, but look at the success Morningside has had and the way that their school's been able to grow. But Hey, it's a different league, different mentality sometimes. Number two, 
Carroll College out of Montana. So six NAI football championships, two runner-up finishes, 25 appearances in the NAI postseason, appeared in the NAI postseason uh, over five different decades. Most people are going to remember their run from 2000 to 2011. They forget about how good they were, you know, in the 80s uh, through the years. Carroll has gone 42 and 16 in uh, postseason play. The coach uh, that was the legendary coach before Van Deest uh, spent those uh, that great run in the 2000s uh, was Bob Petrino Sr., Putter Petrino, as everybody called him. And uh, he was, you know, one of the longtime coaches in the NAI as well, had a lot of success. Yeah, you had all that success in that period with Coach Petrino. Took about, what, a decade or so kind of off. Coach Van Deest comes in, and it's like you hear in the late 90s rumblings, this team in Montana is making a splash again in the NAI. Okay, who's this? Carroll College. Okay. Next thing you know, you're starting to play these guys. My goodness. Um, if we have a, a comp to the great New England Patriots dynasty, this is it, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, six national championships, Jason. I mean, that's that's insane. Um, yeah. They were as well coached, as well prepared, and in, in every facet, not just schematics, but like the conditions they're playing in, they were ready for. And again, and they had a little advantage too when they hosted games out in Montana, no question, because there were some, yeah. some weather situations. But just Coach Van Deese and that staff were just so tight with everything. Every detail was was discussed, prepared. I's dotted, T's crossed in every facet of the game. I mean, just so detailed. And they had great players, and they got them to play at extreme levels. Um, just so impressed. And going there is a different experience. Like we talked about, is there a better place in the NEI to – I mean, to coach is a nightmare, believe me, because I've done it a few times. Um, but what an environment, what a culture, what a fan base, and you have the program along with it. So um, as good as there is, in my opinion. Yeah, and you look at that 2000 to 2011 head coach, Mike Van Deest, offensive coordinator, Nick Hogan, or excuse me, Nick Nick Howlett, Jim Hogan on the offensive line and strength coach. Van Deest was coordinating the defense. So your your core three coaches were there the entire time. It's the NAI level, so you're going to lose guys here and there, take different jobs. Guys got to go take a different way in life and, you know, become, you know, professionals, take actual jobs like you and I. You know, but the the core three were there that entire time. And I think when you have success and you keep that core around, that's what sustains it. That's that's why it made such an that eleven year run was so tremendous because you're dealing with the same people. Right. And what they did with the recruiting base, and then they're taking players that may get overlooked at the two great FCS schools in the state, but they're developing them. I I think their strength and conditioning program. I know Coach Van Deese had a background in that as well, coaching at Northwestern. You know, been you know Evanston, mm-hmm. Illinois, years and years ago. So he has a background that sports performance stuff too. I mean, he's he was exceptional at that. In addition to the remainder of his staff, they got so much of, out of what they had. Um, I mean, they had a lot of lean, fast guys, and they developed them that they didn't look like they'd be fast. And you're like that defenseman, we can't block. Holy smokes, that linebacker yeah. Cooper's pretty darn good. Doesn't look like much, but man, can that guy play? okay, we're going to pick on these corners because we look like we're more athletic, and they're locking you down. And their pass rush was immense. And you had a couple of the greatest players in NEI history. I mean, Tyler Emmert, what's his yep. record? How many national championships? He won all four, didn't he? He won all, he won all four. I mean, he didn't four, play his – fr- He didn't uh, – yeah, I think it is. Is that good? Yeah, he, didn't, he didn't play – well, technically – he took a snap in the first championship game, but he had the shoulder injury. Right. And Rob Latrell was the quarterback for the first uh, run for the first championship. But then, yeah, every year after that, you know, they were winning it. And dominant, and didn't look like much. What do you weigh? One hundred seventy pounds. Got so much out of him. So well prepared. Made every throw. Tough as nails. Um, yeah, they they were just they were the model, Jason. I mean, and again, yeah. what we were, we were pretty darn good. Again, we're what are we top? What are we five on this list? Yeah, you know, six. Where are we? We're St. Francis. We're, you're yeah. nine, right? We're nine. nine. We're nine. Okay, so we're nine. We wanted to be Carroll College. I mean, holy. I mean, that's the way you wanted to do things. Uh, mm-hmm. The way they establish things and, and the culture and again the detail. I mean, do you hear the legend of Bill Belichick and all the practicing and all the situations and scenarios and crossing eyes and dotting t's and detail, detail? That was Carroll College. I mean, they yeah. just had it all figured out, and you know you're going into a game that was going to be fast and physical, and you know those coaches had those players ready to go for any situation. Everything that you did well, they were going to take away. 
Uh, they were going to make you left-handed as much as possible. And we knew that going into it. And they always had some special for us too. So they were, um, yeah. For, uh, and I think, I think the other thing that you look at with Carroll College and in St. Francis and, and and some of these great programs is the buy-in from the school and also and and I'll talk to this on, on a personal level a little bit buy-in from the athletic director having the support from the athletic director who understands like this is a major thing this is football we want to be we know what we've got to do here and Bruce Parker the you know he he passed a few years ago the late Bruce Parker uh, was a friend of mine and, and a guy I respected a lot as an NAI athletic director and and he did a lot of the stuff behind the scenes with fundraising and putting things together to to take some of that off of the coaching staff so they didn't have to worry about that I, I look at you know, programs like your dad's when, when they started off early on and, and he was the guy, he was the guy that had to do all of this and, and a great program like Carol, they actually had an athletic director and some support staff that was able to, Hey, we're going to do a fundraiser. We're going to do uh, an auction or whatever. And, and he didn't have to head coach and do that as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's the other thing too, as good as they were, they were as nice of people as yeah. they were just all of them. I mean, think about coach Hogan and coach Van just, Wonderful guys, Bruce Park. Got a chance to meet and spend some time with him. Just wonderful people, and they were they were at top of the game for many many years, and and were first class along with it. So yeah, yeah. I always I always got a lot of crap because you know I would go to Carroll every year for a game. I I, I would know those people and be like, oh, you're playing favorites with them. They're great people. I want to, I don't want to go to some program that I'm going to get treated like dirt at or like I'm a secondhand citizen and just like, oh, well, that, that VSN guy's here. Like, and nobody talks to you. Like, you, you go up to Montana, it's like, hey, man, we're uh, we're going to this this party down the road at this guy's house. You want to come with? And it was like, yeah, I guess I do. Yeah. Let's go. <laughs> you got to experience all that there, didn't you? Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, was, it, was, um, it was great. Great group of guys, no doubt. The number one program from my top twenty top top point top twenty five. Holy cow! You can't speak late than show. The uh, number one team in the history of the NAIA top twenty five programs of all time. It's no surprise everybody's already read this list, but Texas A and I seven NAI football championships, one runner up finish, eight appearances in the NAI postseason. A uh, and I now Texas A and M Kingsville. Uh, appeared in the postseason from the 1950s uh, through the end of the 70s. During that time, uh, they only lost uh, one postseason game, which was in 1968 against Troy State, 43-35. to I mean, seven championships and a run like no other uh, with a legendary head coach in Gil Steinke. Uh, it, it is, it's tough to say, oh no, they, they're not the best NAI program of all time. Yeah, you could argue they're not in the NAI anymore, so they don't deserve it, but seven championships and what they did like in the seventies, whew, they were, they were lighting fires, man. Right. And this is one of the, one of the teams, the only team probably can't talk a whole lot about, that we don't know, a lot about. <laughs> but obviously, you know, the history and the success and yeah, I mean, the records are the same, you know, can't, uh, can't deny any of that. And uh, you hear people, the old school NAI guys that saw these teams and yeah, it was, it was legend for sure. I believe the quarterback was Richie Ross. Richie Ross started go. three years. Was he a three year? I, I can't remember who he was. Four. I think it was just a three year starter, uh, but never lost a game. Uh, won a championship every single time. Uh, made it to the postseason. Gil Steinke was the coach. Uh, he's one of the first coaches that uh, innovated actually being uh, up in the stands and, and watching the game and being able to call the offense that way. He was one of the first guys uh, that was going to be up in a booth. And he's kind of credited with uh, being one of the the first like offensive coordinators, coaches to be up there and radio and things down in the in the late uh, '60s when when he was coaching there. So he was the head guy up. did that. He was the head coach. Yep. Was up really? Mm-hmm. Interesting. You said we're not going to be able to talk about him. How dare you? How I dare know. you? I know. I knew you had something. <laughs> Steinke then went on to coach in the USFL for San Antonio. for uh, I think he was coordinator there. And then he became head coach. And then I don't know if they played the season that he was head coach or if he was head coach and that was the year that they folded. But mm-hmm. uh, they, they had some uh, tremendous football players go through there. And that's why – the number number one team all time, I, I would say, in the history of uh, NAI football. I think every list yeah has them as number one because again, seven national championships in the short window was it seven championships in how many years? It was something crazy, wasn't it? Yeah, it, 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 
it was like seven and eight years or something yeah. like that. I that program for those years was as dominant. And then they were, they were very good all of the other years before they went on to uh, division two. Sure. I, I have long said that the, uh, first of all, I thought the national championship trophy should have been named after Gil Steinke. Mm-hmm. Um, instead, Tom Osborne got it. I, uh, I will beat the drum that the NAI coach of the year trophy should be called the Steinke award. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think if you, if you've had the success as a program that he has had, you got to commemorate that somehow. I mean, there's not going to be many guys ever to come and do what, what he did. Uh, and he did for that program, uh, at the NAI level. Yeah. I'm all for naming, you know, NAI specific NAI things, trophies, awards after these great coaches. And again, you think coach Van Deese, coach Donnelly, you know, whomever it may be. Um, I, I'm with you. I'm on board with that. I know you're the type of guy that can get some things done because of your clout and experience in the NAI and the people that you know. Well, you know a lot of people at least. At least, well, you, know, I, at least you know I, people. I know people. I, know people. I have zero clout. I have no ability to get anything it sounded, done. It sounded really good, though. It, it, it did sound it really good. I, good. I appreciate that. I appreciate that you think of me. Yeah, buddy. Uh, being well, able pump, to do pump that. those tires up, buddy. You know, give me some confidence. All right. Well, hey, that's the that's the top twenty five list that gets us through it. We were able to kill an hour doing this, Pat. You know, it was uh, it was like your local you know sports talk radio guys with lists, but it was mm-hmm. fun. I enjoyed it. Um, you know, we'll get some guests on. I think uh, here uh, the remainder of the off season. We got spring ball. We're we're hot and heavy in spring ball. I think around the nation, even up north. Probably not where you are as much because you got a blizzard yeah, coming. It's interesting. They're, they're, they're yeah, you know, but they they're still out there doing it. You know, they'll yeah. they'll go inside to the gym and and do it there. So I mean, where Dickinson State's going to dodge a blizzard and play their spring game in the blizzard or whatever. Yeah, yeah, fun, fun. No, it it, it we I, I look forward to doing the shows with you here uh, in the coming weeks and months where we get coaches on again. But kind of felt like you know, and 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 also this allows us to kind of. You know, get that history thing out of there. Sometimes if we get grief uh, on this show for talking too much about uh, NAI football history. This was one of those shows that Pat and I talked about uh, last fall. Like, you know what? We're just going to do a show on this. Or we're just going to do a show on that. This was one of those shows. We got it out of our system, and we can get back to talking about what's happening in NAI football now on one of our next hey. ones. Hey, it was football history. We weren't talking about music or food or travel, which we talk about that anyway a lot of times. But Yeah of our similar interests or the <laughs> world of sales exciting you know yes um, but yeah this was fun I, I enjoyed it and it's so cool because i'm reminiscing of, of teams i've seen or coached against uh even as a little guy seeing some teams my dad played against you know the finleys of westminster's you know brings back some well not so much fond memories also dad played against carson newman too i remember that very distinctly in in east tennessee so yeah there's there's some memories there for sure so um, I guess for guys in their mid forties, we've experienced quite a bit of NEI football in our time. So yeah, I would, I would say. I, so. I guess we're as good as anybody, at least for our age, uh, to talk about the history of it. So unless definitely you are for sure, um, you're Mister Encyclopedia of NEI football. Nothing stumps yeah. you. Nothing. I, I, it occasionally happens. It occasionally happens. Well, Pat, as always, I appreciate you uh, coming on, doing the show, and uh, we'll be back probably uh, in a. Little- Couple of weeks, who knows? We'll be we'll be back again with some more interviews and for and some more coaches. So Pat again, thanks for coming on. Absolutely. Thank you. All right, for Pat Donnelly, I'm Jason Danley. This has been NAI Football with Donnelly and Danley. We'll see you next time.